Hi, we continue with the story of Hannah and Elkanah in 1 Samuel chapter 1. Uh, right now we continue in verse 19. And if we note from last time, um, the mood changed radically at the end of last our last unit. Um, she had been uh, terribly vexed, as we saw, and the, and the text piled up all kinds of words to describe her feeling, deeply troubled, great anxiety, vexation, etc. And, and she refused to eat, and her heart was sad, and all of a sudden now, simply on the experience of her prayer, no response from Yahweh, but Eli's uh, promise that the God of Israel grant the petition, or at least his own petition that the God of Israel grant the petition, and that's enough to change her all around. So we saw that she, uh, she went uh, on her way, she ate and drank with her husband, and her face was no longer sad. And now suddenly they're together. So when Elkanah uh, last questioned her, why, why, why am I not worth more to you than ten sons? And she didn't answer and turned directly to Yahweh. Now we actually see them together. Um, and not only are they together, in the sense that they rose, they together rose in the morning and worshiped Yahweh. They went back to their house at Ramah, and Elkanah knew his wife Hannah, and the Lord remembered her. So a couple of things here to set this into some context. Um, first of all, let's look at the map a little bit so we can get some sense of places. So Rama is uh, what we're now told is her home. Shiloh up here is where uh, Eli was um, and is. Uh, we don't know what kind of shrine is there, but it'll come up again uh, in the story of Samuel. Uh, we'll use this, the place of Shiloh as a holy location, and Rama will be his base. Uh, we can note some of the other perhaps familiar places, Jerusalem here, but that's not yet an Israelite city. It's a Jebusite city, and it won't become incorporated into the people of Israel's uh, understanding of their own place until 2 Samuel 5, when David takes it from the Jebusite, so a long way off. And of course, a little south of that, Bethlehem, a city also associated with with David. Um, so just a couple of things about the central location there. Um, so now they now things seem well, um, and he knew his wife. This is a use of a, a biblical image that's very familiar from the book of Genesis, yada, as the verb uh, for knowing, um, both in the in the sense of knowing a human being and the sense of sexual intercourse. Um, it's the first of 87 times in Samuel, um, and it'll uh, refer not so much to sexuality, but to intimacy around relationship with, with Yahweh. So again, not intellectual knowing, but relational knowing. So here at 2.12, um, the sons of Eli were scoundrels. That literally, they did not know Yahweh. Uh, and then uh, here in Eli's prayer, or of Samuel rather, um, Samuel did not yet know Yahweh, um, which he will. Um, so, so Elkanah knows his wife and the Lord remembers, um, responding to uh, her hope that Yahweh remember her. Um, and the only time in the Deuteronomistic history that uh, there's a response of Yahweh um, in to remembering somebody in prayer. So we continue here. In due time, or literally at the finished circuit of the year, um, uh, whatever that literally means in this context, the circuit of prayer, the circuit of worship, uh, or the end of their sense of the year uh, before Rosh Hashanah uh, isn't clear here. But whatever time that is, she conceived and bore the son. And we get the beginning of a wordplay that will be repeated in verse 28 and used throughout. And it has baffled scholars throughout the ages. Um, so we just have to look at it and understand what it is before we can try to figure it out. So first, it, she named him Samuel literally from the Hebrew, um, uh, Vitikra et Shmo. Uh, literally, she called his name, highlighting the specific, specificity of it. And and the word for name here, um, uh, Shmo, Shmo here actually is related to Shem or Sham, which is the word for there or a, a particular place. And we'll see that that will come up um, a little later, like here in Sham. And they look the same in Hebrew. So we'll see that word play uh, played out. It also plays out greatly in Genesis as like the Tower of Babel story. But that's for, that's for season one of our Radical Bible series. So she named him uh, Samuel. And Samuel means name of God. But what she says as an explanation is um, for, she said, I have asked him of the Lord. And we see um, Shealti. And what's key here is to explore a little more closely the Hebrew word um, that's at issue here. Because um, this is an occasion where I want to look at the Strong's number so you can see um, uh, what what is at issue here in this wordplay. So here we see 7592E, and we're going to see that used a bunch of times. You can't quite see it here because the transliteration covers it over, but basically the word, the verb for ask is sha'al, which is to say she explains how she named him Samuel by using the name Saul. 
Um, and it's one of those things that's very tricky, but highlighting the interconnection here between Samuel and Saul, um, both in the history of Israel's monarchy, but also in the way this story is unfolding the request for a king. And in Polson's view, as we've looked at earlier and seeing this as an allegory, the request for sons of Yahweh uh, and of Elkanah for sons, um, as a request of Yahweh for kings, um, here, it would suggest that this is parallel now to what we will hear in chapter 8 when the Israelites will ask via her son Samuel um, to have for Yahweh to give them a king. Um, so, um, now that she's born a son, what's going to happen to him? So, the man Elkanah, another strange way to put it, and it matches the earlier thing we saw at the very beginning, a certain man, and now this man, and now he's the man Elkanah. So, whether that's meant to keep him specific or to distance him in some way, rather than to say Elkanah as a person, um, you can decide as a listener or reader uh, what effect that has on you. But the man Elkanah and all his household, which presumably includes Penina and all her children, although she's not mentioned again. Um, the focus is not on the tormentor or the whole set of children that come from her, but simply on on the question of Elkanah and Hannah at this point. So, But they all go up presumably to Shiloh, to offer to the Lord the yearly sacrifice. And again, as we saw back in verse 3, daily, the word uh, day, um, Hayamim here used for uh, to represent yearly sacrifice. He plainly didn't go up and offer a daily sacrifice. And then there's a controversial phrase because of different um, Hebrew and Greek, etc., and to pay his vow. So the Septuagint here, I won't read you all the Greek, but what it means is, and is, and to offer his prayer and all the tithes of the land. Um, which is very different than to pay his vow. If it, we take it as his vow, well, what vow? It was Hannah who entered into a vow um, to not have her son's hair be cut. But we don't know what this vow is, and and uh, it's not in the it's the Septuagint is very different. So. Um, Whatever he did, the authors uh, were not exactly clear. But in any event, it's not about Elkanah, it's about Hannah. And um, she did not go up, for she said to him, As soon as the child is weaned, I will bring him, and he may appear in the presence of Yahweh, the presence of the Lord, and remain there forever. Uh, literally appear to Yahweh's face, parallel to how she was positioned. The Hebrew carries this. Sometimes we've seen the Septuagint um, equalizes the relationship between Hannah and Yahweh and Samuel and Yahweh. Uh, in this case, the Hebrew already had it. So he will be in the same place in relation to Yahweh as his mother was. And remain there forever, uh, Ad Alam, which is generally about kingship uh, and the promise of monarchy. So again, part of Polson's question of whether this is uh, all a stand-in for monarchy or something else. Plainly, the individual person, Samuel, would not remain there forever. Um, and then finally, I will offer him as a Nazarite for all time. This is not only not in the Hebrew, it's not in the Septuagint Greek either. It's from this 4Q Samuel, which is a fragment from the Dead Sea Scrolls of Qumran, as Bodner notes here. Um, and yet the New Revised Standard uses that little piece um, to end this, matching the Nazarite theme earlier, even though the Hebrew nor the Greek have that. Um, so simply, the original would be to, that he may appear in the presence of the Lord and remain there. And so Elkanah says to her something that's very uh, key, and I've got it highlighted here so we can explore that a little more closely. The New Revised Standard says, do what seems best to you, but the phrase literally in the Hebrew is, do what is good in your eyes. And it's really important because it's the very last word of the book of Judges, and it's presented this way. In those days there was no king in Israel. All the people did what was right in their own eyes. Um, and although we don't know if the authors of Genesis or Samuel knew the book of Genesis, it implies the same situation that we see presented in the Garden of Eden story, which is that humans there are made of earth stuff and God's spirit. But when we operate outside of God's spirit, which is to say, do what looks good to us, as the woman does in the garden, looking at the fruit and seeing that it looks good for food and is good for the eyes, um, then diff difficult or bad things can happen. Um, so Polson takes this as um, Elkanah deferring to her human-centered perspective and Elkanah representing a God-centered perspective. But um, one would have to question that since Elkanah has not shown to have any direct relationship with God, and for that matter, Yahweh hasn't responded out loud to either of them so far. Um, 
And it depends on whether we think of Hannah as the hero uh, who brings in Samuel, who will bring in monarchy, a monarchy that Samuel himself has at best mixed feelings about, um, or whether um, she's a problem that's simply looking for something that looks good in her eyes when Elkanah as a stand-in for Yahweh was better uh, than ten sons. Um, you as readers can decide that for yourself. So he says, do what looks good in your own eyes. Wait until after you've weaned him, um, which is to say, of course, when he can uh, eat and go on his own. And may the Lord establish his word. So here, that will echo into 1 Samuel 15. We see here um, the um, regretting the word, that God has regretted the word he's, he's done. Here the phrase establishes word literally is to stand up, that that word may stand up as Hannah earlier rose. So things rising and standing up, becoming firm, um, becoming visible, etc. So she remained and nursed her son until she weaned him. And when she'd weaned him, she took him up with her. Notice no Elkanah, just her again, her second time going up there to Eli. Along the three-year-old bull, there's some controversy in the Hebrew here about whether it's three bulls or um, young bulls or such, or younglings of bulls. That doesn't matter too much for our purpose, but just to note it. An ephah flower, and surprisingly a skin of wine, given that she said she wasn't obviously wasn't drunk, and that she'd vow her son not to drink. Um, so the fact that she brings wine, is she bringing it for Eli? Um, uh, she doesn't. We never hear that she drinks it. So she brought him to the house of, of Yahweh at Shiloh, and the child was young, which seems like a strange phrase. So in the Hebrew, it's even stranger. Bahana'ar na'ar, which is literally, and the child was a child. Um, but as Sumara notes, the term na'ar indicates someone of whatever age under the authority of another person and not free legally to act as an independent individual. So the issue isn't his age. The issue is that he's not an independent person yet. He's somewhere between being weaned, which would match the three-year-old bull, probably weaned around the age of three, um, and subject to somebody else's uh, supervision. So what's, of course, going to happen is um, Samuel is going to go from being under his mother's supervision to under the priest Eli's supervision. So they slaughtered the bull and brought the child to Eli, and she said, speaking to him again, O oh, my Lord, and the word for O oh, here, which we could easily pass by, important Hebrew word B here, um, and you can see that here in the, uh, in the Hebrew, uh, if you like, right here, um, indicating craving permission to address a superior, and always at the beginning of a speech, only here in Samuel. We'd see it here in 1 Kings 3, which is the story of the two prostitutes and the baby who go to Solomon to uh, get a wise decision out of that, and we'll get there eventually. Um, so she clearly expressing deference to the authority of Eli, even though she didn't defer to him earlier. Um, as you live, my Lord, I am the woman who is standing here in your presence, um, as if he forgot. Um, obviously, more than three years have gone by, um, certainly four, the time of her pregnancy and the time of Samuel's infancy. Um, she certainly remembers him. Uh, whether he remembers her or not, we don't know. Um, he doesn't answer that directly. But she summarizes what happened. For this child I prayed, and the Lord has granted me the petition I made to him. Therefore, I have lent him to the Lord. As long as the Lord lives, he is given to the Lord. She left him there for the Lord. So we need to look just a little at the Hebrew here to see how convoluted all the word playing s stuff is here. So, um, here we can see asked here, 7592. Here's 7592 again, um, a couple of times. So in other words, the word for lent here and the word for asked are the same word, which is clearly lost um, in, in, the Hebrew, in the English translation of the New Revised Standard here. Um, but by reminding here that it's for this child I prayed and the Lord has granted me the petition, all about this question of asking. And lending is clearly not right. She's already promised she's going to give him for, forever here. Um, but it's Sha'al again. And as Sumera again helpfully notes, the verb is a performative perfect without worrying about what that means grammatically. Uh, it highlights the fact that saying it makes it happen. Something like uh, a minister or a judge saying, I now pronounce you husband and wife. Um, the, the saying it makes it happen. Um, so in this case, I have given or um, another form of, of ask. So he suggests I will entrust him uh, to Yahweh um, and uh, given here again. In other words, he is, he is Saul. Um, 
And so we're left here with this wordplay that in a way makes no sense to us, and yet it leaves open the question of what exactly is being asked for. Hannah has asked for a son and now given that son away. She's highlighted the fact that um, this child is going to be devoted to Yahweh, but for any particular purpose, she's never mentioned anything about kingship. In fact, you'd never know if there's anything the slightest bit political about this story. If I wasn't highlighting, for example, the role of priesthood, uh, Eli hasn't died yet, and so we wouldn't even see that so far. So if we just read the story on the surface, all we'd see is a story of a woman who can't get pregnant, who prays and God grants her her child, and she's happy with that, and her relationship with her husband is restored, and then she gives the child away, somehow satisfied just with the very fact of having had a child. So we'll have to look at next session where Hannah expresses a, a very exuberant prayer, which again Luke takes advantage of in composing both Mary's Magnificat and Elizabeth's speech in, in Luke's Gospel. And so we'll begin to see um, how this story of Samuel and the story of Jesus um, are a little closer than we might imagine at first. See you next time. Bye-bye.